So, um, so yeah, so limits and sequences. So recall that um, a sequence is just a function. The function, uh, we're going to call it A, uh, going from N to R. So to every, um, to every number, it's going to associate some value. To every number, it's going to associate some value. Um, so it takes for every for every, for every n, we also say some uh, some some value a sub n. So just remember that the notation for sequences is a little bit different from the notation for functions. You know, normally for a function, right, you have some function from, from r to r. You know, it takes x to usually you have f of x, right? It would make it would make perfect sense to write a of n here, okay? But for sequences, the, the convention is to write a sub n. Instead of, instead of a, a but it's the same same thing, okay, the same name. Right. Um, okay, and um, one often uh, one often notes the full sequence like this. One often uses this this sort of notation. So this means that. You have a sequence a sub n where the indices run from one to infinity. Right. This denotes the sequence, the sequence a sub n where n ranges from one <coughs> to infinity. Okay. Um, so just to uh, just to remind us, um, so if I have something like this, a sub n is 1 minus uh, 1 over 2 the n, and maybe from 1 to infinity. If I get something like this, then, then what I mean is that um, you, know, you start from index 1, so a1 is going to be um, is going to be 1 minus 1 over 2 to the 1, so it's 1 minus one minus a half, right? A two is going to be is going to be what? Two minus uh, one minus one over two. <coughs> one over uh, one minus one over two squared. Square, right? So it's going to be you know one one minus four. Right? This one is one minus a half. This is one minus four. This one is going to be one minus one minus eight, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. One minus one over two cube, let's say one minus one eight, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Right? So this is a half, this is three fourths, and this is seven eighths. So this is how we, uh, you know, this is, this is just an example of, this, of the sequence. Um, okay, and uh, yeah, just just like we did for um, just like we did for functions, um, we're going to we're going to define a notion of limit. So we say we say that the limit of a sequence. Right, so let a sub n be a sequence. We say that the limit is L if, if something happens. And by now you're probably kind of tired of, of, of me asking you this, but what, what do you think, how do you think we define this? We say that the limit is L if, I, I'm not going to waste more than a minute on this. Uh, who wants to, who can, who can make a guess? <coughs> if a sub n equals a of uh, So we say that the limit of this sequence is L, right? So as n tends, as n tends towards infinity, we say that this, this sequence heads off towards some value L. Um, and, and like 
if, um, if given, it's the same sort of thing. If given any, um, given any epsilon, there's a time, so that past that time, the values of your sequence are within that tolerance of epsilon. Does this remind anybody of anything? This is actually really similar to something else. Ellen, what's it? Um, the, the definition of the M and the, I forget what it's called, but... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, as, as, like, if you draw a line, like a vertical line, um, triangles M, and then you say that any point past it is going to be smaller than F1, and you're going to get closer and closer. Yeah, yeah. So this is, this is actually almost, a, it's almost the same thing as um, the limit of f x being L as x, as x goes to infinity, right? It's almost exactly the same definition, right? Remember you have, um, we have something like this, right? Here's our, here's our L, our function, uh, for our function to have that as a limit means that, um, you know, if given any tolerance, there's a time past which that tolerance is satisfied. The only difference here is that, is that instead of having a function here, Instead of having a function here, we have, we have a sequence, right? So it's something like this. So it's just it's not it's not it's not a continuous thing. It's a it's a, it's just a bunch of dots. Okay. And all and what we're saying is that you know, given any given any so if this is my L, if this is this is L, then given some given some uh, some bracket around it, uh, you know, there's some time. At past which all the dots fall within those two, fall within the two, um, fall within the upper and lower lines. So it's the same thing every time. So wouldn't that also be considered a Scooby theorem? Uh, no, no, um, no. The squeeze theorem is telling you um, uh, if you have, if you have, in the, say, in the case of functions, like if you have one function that gets arbitrarily close, and you have another function that's arbitrarily close, then the guy in the middle has to, has to, has to, has to tend to that value. It's, a, it's something, um, this is, this is just, this is just the definition of a limit. This is just the definition. Um, sequence and it goes it converges to some value okay. and then we um, uh, and then suppose we change the first billion terms of that sequence suppose we change the first billion terms of that sequence and then after that nothing happens um, what uh, does that do you think that changes the limit do you think that changes the limit who, who thinks it does and who thinks it doesn't <clears throat> Could you repeat the question, please? Yeah. So, um, suppose you have some sequence. Or actually, um, actually, let me let me back. So, um, let me do an example. Let me just give an example example of this. So, uh, earlier we had the sequence. A sub n is one minus <coughs> one minus one over two to the n, right? And those guys we saw were a half, three fourths, seven eighths, 15 sixteenths, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And so, what do you think the limit is? What do you think the limit is? You, one point. One. Right? So you, you, that's, that's what you think, right? The limit is going to be one. Right? And so let's, let's see how we would show it. Um, 
using using the limit definition. So using yeah, and so yeah, this is true. This is true. Let's see how we do it uh, using the limit definition. Uh, apply. Okay. So uh, sort of as you do before, right? Given any f1 greater than zero, well, let's take n so that one over two n is less than f1. So take, take a look, um, right? Uh, somebody gives you this epsilon and says, I would like you to make your sequence within, within that epsilon of one. I would like you to make your sequence, uh, the distance of your sequence, the, the, the distance of some point in your sequence from, um, from the limit to be smaller than that, smaller than that epsilon. Okay. Right. And it turns out, you say, well, okay, as long as I, look, if, as long as I take, um, as long as I take this, this take this time so that one over two to the n is smaller than epsilon, then um, then any time we pass that, then the thing is, is within 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 uh, epsilon of, of one. So somehow I feel like I'm not I'm not getting through to you guys this morning. Are you? <laughs> oh, how is everybody? Maybe I should I should not say. How is everybody? Are you alright? No, you seem kind of dead. Yes, Leanne. Leanne. Um, okay, so why are you subtracting another one at the end? Where is that coming from? That's the thing that you're trying to make the, the that's the thing you're trying to make the the the, uh, the sequence close to. Okay. 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 So let me let me see this. Yeah. Okay. So you have the sequence. Here it is. One over one over I'm sorry, one minus one minus one minus one to, to the two over n. Okay. The limit. The limit we think is one. In fact, it is one. And it's in the box, right? As n gets big, this thing is going to become tiny, and then this, and the thing will tend to one. Okay. So you're trying to find a time past which all these guys. So if somebody gives you an epsilon, given an epsilon, right? You want to find a time past which all these guys are within that epsilon of one. So you think, okay, how do I figure out that time? How do I figure out that time? Well, I'm going to look at look at the thing I'm trying to control. Well, I want uh, right. You think I'd like here's your scratch. Here. You say, well, I'd like a sub n minus one to be smaller than epsilon. Okay. I'd like a sub n minus one to be smaller than epsilon. Okay. Um, well, what is that? A sub n is 1 minus 1 over 2 to the n. Right. That's 1 minus, right. that's, that's what it is, right? So what is that? Well, the 1's cancel off, and that's, that's this, right? So as long as, um, um, so that, that sort of motivates you to say, well, OK, so. Uh, we're going to take 
by time to be so that this is smaller than epsilon. Right? Because then past that time, all of these things are going to be smaller than epsilon. Mm -hmm. Some of you are smiling. I'm smiling. <laughs> <laughs> So let, me, let, me, let me say it like this. Let me say it like this. Say, well, I, I would like this thing to be smaller than epsilon. What do we have to do to make that happen? Well, 1 over 2 the n smaller than epsilon. Uh, what, is, what does that mean? I'm going to uh, 2 to the minus n smaller than epsilon. I'm uh, going to write this like this, natural log of 2, natural log of 2 minus n is smaller than natural log of epsilon. It's okay to take natural logs. Natural log doesn't change the sign. Right? I, pull, I use the powers of the natural log, I pull that out, I have a minus n here. Right. Everyone okay? I think we're just using, we're just seeing what this means. We're just seeing what this means, right? We take natural log of both sides. We use the power. We, you know, natural log of a number to a power is that you can pull the power out. Remember, right? Okay. So that what does that tell me about n? Right? It tells me I'm going to divide both sides by natural log of two, and that tells me that n has to be bigger than uh, negative natural log of epsilon over natural log. So, given f1 uh, bigger than 0, take n to be any number bigger than negative natural f1 or natural f1. Then, right, if little n is bigger than that, is even bigger than that, we see that um, <coughs> 1 over 2 the n is smaller than epsilon, right, by, by exactly this thing here on the right side, right? So, so our, 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 our sequence minus 1 will be smaller than epsilon. Okay. So this is, and, and, so, and so we see that this sequence does go to 1. So we see that this, so, the limit is then actually this one at the end of the Maybe I should, I can make this even more clear. Or actually, just make it more clear. Make it clear, um, right? Because if n is bigger than n, then one over two the n. Uh, I'm sorry, it's two the n is bigger than two to the capital n. So one over two the n is smaller than one over two the capital n. Right? And we just saw that. Um, and being big, capital M being bigger than this means that this thing is smaller than epsilon. So this is this is just an example. Don't don't worry too much about this. I'm not going to ask you, you know, you know, really complicated things about proving proving limits and stuff. But I, I think you sh should at least see it. Um, uh, so so at this point now, now let me say suppose we take our take our function here. Suppose we take our function here, 
and we mess up the first billion terms of it. Okay. Suppose we mess up the first billion terms. Just we just choose random numbers for the first billion terms. <coughs> Does that change the limit? No, it doesn't change the limit. And the way that you have to fix the way um, all you have to do here is choose n to be any number bigger than uh, uh, any number bigger than a billion. Bigger than a billion, so that you would just ignore the first billion terms. Right? You say, well, I'm, I don't know what you did with those first billion terms. I'm just going to pretend that you didn't. I'm going to choose some time past those first billion terms, and, and then you know what you did won't, won't do anything. Okay. So that's 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 how that's how this thing uh, uh, allows you to avoid any problem with people who mess up the first billion terms of a sequence. So the, po the point is that if you're talking about limits, then stuff that happens in a finite range doesn't matter. Right? You know, all you care about is what happens at infinity. Okay. Um, Sequence has a limit, we call it convergent. Okay. Convergent means you have a limit. Divergent means there's no limit. Yes, So um if one of them is a two if one of the sequences does not have a limit, then you can you can you can use this. Apply. Okay. Yeah, you can apply this. Yeah. For example, um, let me show you. You could have something crazy. You could have something like a sub n is negative 1 to the n, b sub n is negative 1 to the n plus 1. Okay. These guys don't have any limit, right? A sub, one, a, sub, a sub n is bouncing back and forth between minus 1 and 1. b sub n is bouncing back and forth between 1 and negative 1. It's doing the opposite of what, what a, a is. Neither of these guys have a limit, so no limit and no limit, but the sum actually has a limit. Right? Because when a is 1, b is negative 1. When a is negative 1, b is 1. And so their sum actually does have a limit. Okay. So, you know, um, 
we, we, we try to avoid sort of crazy things by saying we're going to assume that, uh, first we assume that both of these guys have limits. And in that case, then the arithmetic works. Then you can do arithmetic. The same thing is true for the functions. Right? The functions have to have limits first in order for the, for the rules to, to, to apply them. In order for the properties to hold. Uh, right, so these, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, we also have a uniqueness of limit statement, right, that there's, you can't have a sequence that tends to two, two separate numbers, right? right. There's the, the limit is unique. Um, one also has a pinching theorem. Right? You, you can guess it, right? If you have, if you have a sequence, if you have three sequences, and you know, at some point, you know, past some point, uh, the guy is somebody in the track between the other two. Then, if the guys on the end tend towards the limit, then the guy in the middle is forced to tend towards that same limit. Okay. You, you can you can guess. Do, do you want me to write it out? I think it's pretty straightforward. Okay. Um, then there's this thing about limits and continuous functions, which is um, uh, goes as follows. Right. Um, this should I should state um, say that the limit of a sub n is L as n goes to infinity, and f is continuous at L. Then, then the limit of f of a sub n as n goes to infinity is f of L. This is what this is saying is that again, continuity means you can pass the limit through. Continuity means you can pass the limit, pass the limit. Um, the limit of f of a sub n as n to infinity is the same thing as f of the limit of a sub n as n. This is this is L. I, I personally I like to write it this way rather than this way, even though they, they mean exactly the same thing. I think it's more uh, illustrative, you know, more. This makes it clear what's what's going on. Continuity means that you that limits can go past it. So, for example, we had that sequence earlier: one minus one minus uh, one over two to the n. Which converge to one, like this thing converge to one. Like, um, one often uses this abbreviation, converges to. Converges to one. Right. Um, so if somebody said, uh, what about you know the square root of of, um, of a sub n? What about the square root of a sub n? What will that, what will that go converge to? Well, you say, well, the square root is just a continuous function. So I'm just going to converge to this. Right, this thing is going to converge to the square root of the limit. Right, the square root of the limit of the limit of the square root of this thing is going to be just the square root of the limit. That's the same. Continuity. We, we had we had something like this before, like continuity of limits, limits and continuity. Okay. Okay. So um, okay. So 
the, their, their, these properties, um, and uh, um, there are a couple, couple of important sequences. So. They're sort of obvious. Um, we're not gonna. I'm just. We're just gonna. We're just gonna take them. Okay. We're not going to. We're not gonna prove them. We're just gonna. We're gonna I'm just gonna give them to you. So here it is. Um, uh, so you have some number in the reals, and you have some positive. You have some positive number. Some positive number. So you take n to some power, and then you let n go to become gigantic. So what will it be? Infinity. Infinity. Even if you take like some tiny power, you know, 0 0.001. Right? Right? Well, your sequence. Right, your base is, is going to become gigantic, and no matter how tiny a power you, you start off with, that's some fixed power of something that's huge. It will, it will tend to infinity. Right. Second one, uh, maybe I don't even need to state the second one. If you have one over n to some tiny power, and n becomes huge, then this will go to mm -hmm. zero. It'll go to zero. It'll go to zero for the same reason that the one above went to infinity. Right. In fact, I don't even know why I'm including this one. Okay. Uh, C. If your number r is less than one, then the limit of r to the n as n goes to infinity is, is 1. If the size of your number is small, so r lies between negative 1 and positive 1, right? you choose some small number r, right? and then you keep on taking powers of it, what will happen to it? What will it tend to? <clears throat> Take a guess? Zero. Zero. And the opposite, um, if your number is bigger than one, and you take powers of it, well, it's a little bit tricky. If you take powers of the absolute value of it, If it's bigger than one, it would have to be positive, so... If the magnitude is bigger than one. Oh. So it can be a huge negative, it be a large negative number. What will happen? Infinity. It would infinity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The size of it. If you're taking something positive, you're taking something, you're taking something positive and raising it to a power, and that power is becoming giant. Right? So if you're taking something bigger than one, and then taking powers of it. Right. So that tells you, you know, about how uh, how these powers behave. Um, okay. Are there any of these that 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 uh, that don't seem completely that don't seem clear to people? Right. If you take if you take n to some tiny power and let n become gigantic, these become infinite. If you take some number that's in magnitude smaller than one and raise it to a huge power, it, it vanishes. Right? Because right? if you take something that in magnitude is bigger than one, raise it to a huge power, it becomes huge. Right? These, these are all pretty straightforward. Um, the last one. 
So you take some positive number and take the nth root of it as n goes to infinity. Does anyone know, know what happens to this? You take some you take some positive number, you know, it could be like 0 0.01, and then you take the square root of it, you take the third root of it, you take the fourth root of it, you take the fifth root of it, root of it et cetera, et cetera. Or you know, you take some, you know, like take three, you take this, uh, you take this nth root, and you let n become gigantic. What happens to it? Is it? Oh, one. One, yeah, it tends to, it actually is one as well. Is that just because 1 over n becomes um, 0? Basic approach yeah. 0. Yeah. yeah, although in some sense that's not a good. Uh, you could say that one says that something to the 0 power is 1 because of this. So it's sort of like the opposite reason. So, um, okay, so uh, I'm, I'm just going to introduce these. Um, uh, we'll use them, uh, we'll use them mainly to uh, make guesses about, um, about limits. So, um, so here's some examples of, of how one calculates limits. Um, Say okay, as n goes to infinity, uh, suppose you take the limit as n goes to infinity of something like this. So um, what one does, and right, if, if you try to do these things independently, right, you see that the top goes the, the top goes to uh, well, it's, maybe it's not clear what the top goes to. What does the top go to? Infinity. You got infinity, something huge. Okay. So um, the way one the way one deals with this is uh, probably familiar to you. Um, you divide top and bottom by the same uh, the same high power. So you look for the you look for the highest power involved, right? Highest power. Uh, Either in the top or in the, either in the top or bottom, on top or bottom, and you divide by the highest power, and so you end up with one minus one over n, one plus one over n. Okay, and then as n goes to infinity, um, like we said, well, this thing is going to go to zero. This thing is going to go to zero, so we end up with one. So you've got this 2 to the minus j. It's the same thing as 1 over 2 to the j. 1 over 2 to the j. Minus? It goes to 3. It goes to 3. It goes to 3 because as j goes to infinity, this, this thing becomes 3. There's another one. Uh, another example. The limit of n goes to infinity of 2 plus cosine n over n squared. Somebody like to make a guess as to what happens? Oh. It's going to go to zero. It's going to go to zero, and, and k 
can you justify it? Can we justify uh, it using the... Well, because cosine m's ranges are positive or negative one. Mm -hmm. So no matter what you add to two, that's going to be like three, or around there, less than three, mm -hmm. over some negative number. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So you say, well, you know, to make it, to make it this, you know, rigorous, you can use the pinching count. You say, well, look, two plus cosine m over m squared is smaller than three over m squared. Smaller than or equal to three over m squared. And it's bigger than or equal to one over m squared. Right. And you know that one over m squared goes to zero, and three over m squared also goes to zero. Right? Which of these guys goes to zero. So by pinching term, this guy in the middle can go to zero also. What do you think happens to this one? What do you think happens to this one? Anyone like to make a guess? Samantha? Um, go to four. Go to four, why? Why? Yes, it does. Why? Exactly the way to think. Thing, this, you think, well, this, these guys are not going to matter. This thing, this j squared, is squared, but it's also square rooted, right? And so basically, this thing on the bottom is going to be like j. It's going to be like a j. Okay. And you can make that. You can make that a little bit more uh, believable if you divide top and bottom by j. So on the top, I'm going to get four. On the bottom, right? I've got this. J squared plus J squared plus five J plus two. And I've got this one over J here, right? But I'm going to write, rewrite the one over J as one over root J squared, right? And that allows you to, you can slide it in then, right? This becomes, um, this becomes, becomes this. Right? You slide, you slide the J into the square root. Right. When you slide that when you slide that one over j into the square root, you end up with one over j squared, right? square root of j squared. Right. Okay, and so now it looks more believable. Like you've got this four here. You've got the square root of one plus five over j plus two over j squared. As j goes to infinity, right? And then as j goes to infinity, these guys go to zero, and you know, you've got your law of continuity that says that. Square root of this thing is going to be the the limit of the square root of this thing is going to be the square root of the limit, which is which is one over one. Any any questions? Any questions? Okay, last one. Um, last one is uh, this is tricky. I don't know. Uh, the limit of n goes to infinity. Uh, cosine of pi and sine pi m over 2 over 2. Okay. Seconds and see if you can find the answer. Or maybe you know it already.
okay, turn to somebody next to you and say, this is just, mm. Professor, I'll give you your 132 